So, hello everyone. My name is Sophie Chiantafilidou and I'm a Vice President on the ISNT Board of Directors. I want to welcome you to the six, the six in the series of seminars featuring the best student research from Electronic Imaging 2020. I would like to start by taking a moment to thank an individual donor who wishes to remain anonymous and the Imaging Science Group of the Royal Photographic Society in the UK for supporting this program. Their support will help us provide electronic imaging registration grants and ensure the continuation of this online seminar series. I would also like to take a couple of minutes to tell you about ISNT and in particular the Electronic Imaging Symposium. Second. Okay, so for those not familiar with the Society of Imaging Science and Technology, the Society is unique in that it is a place where industry and academia meet, which makes it, its meetings a great place for students to showcase work to prospective employers and for those in industry to learn about exciting developments in imaging research. ISNT spans imaging across applications from vision and capture through processing to output. Its conferences, courses and journals offer a place to share the latest innovations with a network of others who have a love for and curiosity about the world of imaging. ISNT's breadth is best found at the Electronic Imaging Symposium where 20 conferences and more than 25 courses offer everything from AR, VR and autonomous vehicles to big data, remote imaging and mobile devices. Two great features um, about electronic imaging are the open access proceedings and the ability to submit a journal paper, which of course gives you a general citation in lieu of a proceedings paper, but still give, be able to give a talk. Oops. Electronic Imaging 2021 will be held online and the Electronic Imaging Conference Committees are currently constructing programs that offer high quality papers with many opportunities to connect, communicate and network as you would in person. Electronic Imaging can be a bit overwhelming at times, but it's a great place to learn about the ways the fundamental science and technology explored in academic settings can be incorporated into products uh, to improve our world. For students, it offers registration grants, a student young professional research showcase, a demonstration se session, which is a little bit like show and tell, conference best paper awards and the ability to take courses for free. I encourage you to explore what electronic imaging has to offer and to submit relevant research to it. We are still accepting papers and the final deadline uh, I gather is the 5th of October. Now on to today. Our goal for the seminar series is to engage you all in a discussion after the talk. We want everyone here to feel part of the conversation. So to facilitate this, please take a minute to rename yourselves on Zoom, uh, on Zoom uh, with using your first and last names plus your affiliation. Um, excuse me, this is, yeah. Um, this will help us to get to know each other. We would also like if you could turn your camera on after the talk during the discussion time. Um, so this slide shows you how to rename yourselves. And finally, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Matthew Finney, a graduate research assistant in the Holo Reality Group at the University of Iowa. Matthew is working towards his PhD in studying applied image and signal processing. His talk today introduces a novel method for compressing 3D data in such a way that points of interest in high-speed, high-precision acquisition for applications such as medicine, communication, physical security, and entertainment as are well preserved. To you, Matthew, now. I'm stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, I want to preface so, my talk by just um, by saying that um, it's really an honor to be here. I, I didn't get a chance to see all of the other presentations, but I, I got to see a fair number of them and just the, the quality of work that's coming out of everybody is just phenomenal. So I'm really excited to be uh, a part of the group that gets to uh, present in this seminar series. So thank you guys for having me. 
and hopefully I can shed some light on the, um, the problem that is 3D image compression. Um, so just some, some accolades of this piece of work that I'm about to discuss. It did win the best student paper at the 3D Measurement Data Processing Conference at EI 2020. Um, and an extension of this work with some additional introductory material and experiments uh, was published in Applied Optics in, um, in June of 2020 as well. So, um, and then uh, just shout out to some of my other collaborators, Jacob Nishimura and Dr. Tyler Bell, who um, you know, helped, provide, or helped develop this work. So. Just a brief outline of what I'm going to be discussing today. I'm going to start with some introductory material and general motivation for 3D and 3D range data in general. Um, I'll start by talking about, you know, what is 3D range data, how we get it, and why we need to compress it. And then I'll talk more specifically about, uh, about the method that I'm presenting today. Uh, I'll talk about some specific motivation that, that caused us to, to want to build this method, um, the mathematical principle behind it, and then I'll, I'll share some experimental results that kind of corroborate the um, the, the principle. But, so like I said, I'm going to start with some introductory material and that brings me to this slide. What is 3D range geometry, right? So um, at, its, at its simplest form, it's a surface scan. So unlike something like an MRI that might be iterating through a depth range where you're slicing um, and getting a like a volumetric 3D scan, we're instead just scanning the surface of a, of a scene or an object. So here are some examples. Uh, on the left here, you have a, a very high precision 3D scan of a, of a footprint in soil. Um, that could be used for something like uh, like forensic sciences or metrology. Here in the middle, you have a, um, a scan of a human face that could be uh, used for telecommunications or entertainment. And on the right, there's some LIDAR data, which is also an example of 3D range geometry and um, is, is, very, is a very hot topic in the autonomous vehicle space right now. Um, some other applications that... Um, some other applications, sorry, something popped up on my screen here, but some other applications that utilize 3D range geometry are collaborative design. So um, NVIDIA is a company, I'm sure you all know their graphics cards, but they are trying to, to get engineers and architects and other people into a virtual reality space so they can interact with 3D range data and they can you know, zoom in, blow it up, um, make measurements, annotate stuff, and in general, just promote uh, collaborative design within a, a virtual reality space. Um, this other company, Nomad Eek, and this, this may be in, especially important with the pandemic going on right now, but they're trying to promote telemedicine with, uh, with virtual reality. So instead of interacting with a patient that may be sick, you can now bring that, that patient or like an affected area or wound to doctors in a virtual environment by you know scanning the affected area and then you, you no longer have to, to be in close contact with those people, which could prevent the spread of disease. Um, additionally, for so I you know the first two applications here were kind of um, you know commercial applications, but what about consumers and Facebook uh, or Oculus um, are bringing virtual reality and, and 3D to to the consumer with um, their Oculus Quest 2, and this was actually uh, these two uh, the first two that I talked about um, were big initiatives in I think early 2019 or late 2018, but this was just last week that uh, that Facebook announced they were releasing this this new very inexpensive virtual reality headset, which is really going to uh, drive the ability to do um, to you know to interact with 3D range geometry forward inexpensively for for entertainment purposes or for other applications. Um, so what about, uh, you know, how, how do we get 3D data? 3D data? So we've talked about, you know, what 3D range geometry is, and we've talked about, you know, applications that could potentially use it, but how do we capture it? And I could go into some detail about, you know, uh, structured light scanning systems where you have an offset projector and camera or stereo vision systems or time of flight systems. But instead, I think it's sufficient for this talk to just say that there's a lot of devices that capture 3D data. So uh, one example is the iPhone and iPad. You can get 3D from them. Uh, Microsoft's line of connects also provide 3D data. And as I discussed earlier, um, a lot of autonomous vehicles or, or companies that are moving towards autonomous vehicles are also capturing very large scale 3D, 3D data as well. So we've, you know, we've talked about what 3D data is. We've talked about how we get it. And the whole point of this, this talk is really about compression. So why do we need compression? And to, to illustrate this, I'll revisit this, this scan of a footprint in soil that I used earlier. Um, and like I said, it's a pretty high resolution scan. It has a, a, a 1920 by 1200 pixel resolution. And in its raw form, that's 36 megabytes of 3D data. So that might not seem a lot like a lot. You know, you can, you can store that on a thumb drive. But as you get tens or hundreds or thousands of these scans, that quickly becomes prohibitive, prohibitive in terms of long-term storage. 
um, let alone if you want to you know, store it on the cloud or if you want to stream that data um, in real time or you know, send it you know, over the internet, um, that becomes very expensive very quickly. Another example, at slightly more modest resolution, we have this scan of a human face, and that's only 640 by 480 pixels. And by the way, I think that this is the, the, the resolution of the iPhone's um, 3D scanner. I think it's 640 by 480. I may be wrong there. but um, So it's a lower resolution scan, and um, it's five megabytes in its raw form. So the 3D data here is five megabytes um, for, for a pretty modest frame. But if I wanted to use this for something like telecommunications, where I want to stream that data at even only 30 frames per second, that becomes 1.2 gigabits per second of data. And I don't know about you guys, but here in, in little old Iowa, we can't even buy internet that fast. So that's certainly prohibitive to applications that would want to use this technology. So we need to compress the data. How do we do that? Um, one very popular approach is to take our 3D information and to smoosh it into the, the three color channels, the three 8-bit color channels of a traditional 2D RGB image, um, which allows us to, to make use of these really mature, well-defined um, uh, 2D compression formats, image compression formats like JPEG or PNG. Um, additionally, we're able to use 2D image processing techniques to, you know, to further modulate our data such that we can achieve file size savings to really enable these applications that we want to use 3D. Uh, the problem with that is, though, as I said, the individual color channels of our 2D RGB image are only 8 bits. So we have access to 256 values and we want to represent our data. So this example illustrates how that may be a problem. So let's take that scan of a human face and let's say that it's 100 millimeters worth of depth values, right? There's 100 millimeters um, depth range within this, this scan, uh, just to make the math easier. And let's say we want to represent that data at 0.1 millimeters uh, worth of precision, right? So we want to interact with it and be able to see 0.1 millimeter uh, increments. So to do that, we'll need a thousand values. So 100 divided by 0.1 uh, is a thousand. So we need access to a thousand values, but we only have access to 256. So that's definitely a problem. So what we have to do instead of just storing our data, we actually have to encode it into these color channels. So um, that illustrates this idea of sinusoidal encoding. So if I don't do that, um, if I don't do any encoding, I just directly store it, you can see that I have my, my 0 to 255, my 8-bit color channel, and I have access for every one pixel value, I have access to only one encoded value because I'm not doing any, any encoding, it's just linear. But if I take my data, and we'll call our data Z here uh, for depth, um, if I take it and I modulate it sinusoidally, if I throw it into a sinusoid with some other parameters, um, with one sinusoidal encoding period, so one, one encoding period, um, for each of my 256 values, I now have access to two encoded values that we can see here. So if I increase the frequency of my sinusoid and I, give, I get two encoding periods now, then I have access to four encoded values per pixel value um, of our encoded image. So, uh, and the four is what you'll need to get this thousand values, 256 times four gives us sufficient, a sufficient number of values to represent our data at the required precision. Um, and so th these encoding periods, these, um, the number of encoding periods present in the scene is, or present in the encoded image rather, is defined by this, this parameter P here, which is called the fringe width. And the fringe width is, it, it's kind of in, uh, confusing because I'm gonna say encoding periods versus fringe width, but fringe width is P, but I'm going to mostly refer to it as encoding periods and that's the inverse of P. So it's one over P or N here. Um, so if you hear me talking about that, then, then that's what it's related to. And as the number of encoding periods increases, then the frequency of our sinusoids are going to increase, which makes sense. And as a result, the spatial frequency of our encoded data is going to increase, which just is, is fairly intuitive. Um, as the number of encoding periods, as the higher, as the number of encoding periods increases, we also get higher precision, which makes sense based on the example I just, I just gave. Uh, you get access to more values, so you have more precision. As a result, though, you get larger file size because you're storing more values. So that's, that's all reasonably intuitive. Here is a, a, an example that makes that a little bit more concrete, I think. So if I encode this ideal hemisphere with a range of 256 millimeters with two encoding periods using these sinusoidal equations that I've, I've um, defined up here, um, with two encoding periods, I get some RMS error and I get some file size associated with the output. Um, if I use six encoding periods, so I decrease P or increase N, then um, my error goes down and my file size goes up by 66 and 53% respectively, um, which are about equivalent. So, um, so yeah, so increased frequency gives greater precision, but more file size is the, the takeaway from this slide here. Um, so moving on to, you know, we've, we've discussed what 3D range geometry is. 
We've discussed um, you know, what applications it can be used for, how we get it, and why we need to compress. And we've discussed kind of a, a brief idea of how people like to compress 3D range data. Uh, so moving on to our specific method, something that we can notice there is that parameter P in, mo in all methods that I'm aware of is fixed. It's, um, it's just a constant, it's just P. Um, and this could be a problem because if you have something like this very high resolution scan of the surface of Mars that was captured by, I'm a space nerd, so I think this is really cool, but um, it was captured by the high rise project with uh, NASA, JPL, and the University of Arizona. But you have this really cool crater in the middle and then you kind of have maybe a less cool plane that's surrounding it. So this is definitely the feature that I care about. And if I wanna encode that with a lot of precision, if I wanna be able to store that with really great fidelity, then I'm gonna to have to, using a fixed frequency method like existing methods, I'm going to have to, to store all of this information, all of this, all of this plane with the same frequency. Or if I want low file size, then I'm not gonna be able to store anything with, with very high precision. I'm gonna to have to reduce the precision on everything globally. Um, and that, that's really a problem when we have interesting geometry like this, where we don't care about all of it. We care about you know, maybe a slice of it, but we still wanna to, want to see the context, right? We wanna see that this is still sitting on a plane. So I can't just truncate, you know, I can't just truncate only this region of interest. But so how do we do that? You know, how, how, can, we, how can we fix our method to utilize um, a variable encoding frequency such that we can encode things that we care about with greater precision while reducing that, that precision constraint elsewhere in the frame? Um, first, we take this idea of multi-wavelength depth encoding, which is a, which is a pretty well-defined compression method that utilizes these two high-frequency sinusoidal encoding signals that I've been discussing uh, up to this point. And then uh, it uses a, a third signal because I've, I've talked about the three 8-bit color channels of a 2D RGB image um, to use to store things, but I've only talked about two signals. So we use that third, that third color channel to store, in this case, a normalized version of the, the original depth information. And I use that in order to get the depth information back out of these, these sinusoidal equations. Um, it's interesting to note because people may think, you know, you're storing this normalized depth map in the third color channel. Um, isn't that just your data? It is, but as I discussed earlier, it's very susceptible to uh, the effects of compression and it's getting quantized. So this will be heavily quantized if the range of, um, of the depth information is, is greater than 256 values, which is the whole problem in the beginning. So to, in order to, to get this variable parameter, well, really it's, it's very simple. We just make it variable, right? Um, and that may seem simple, but it's, it's not quite that easy. Um, it, it, although the equations look very similar, getting P to be a, a variable parameter is, is reasonably nuanced. Um, physically, this is what these equations look like. So we have our variable P here, and you can see that I've actually represented it as one over P or in the number of encoding periods like I discussed previously. Um, and the number of encoding periods is high where, the, where this image is lighter and it's low where this region or where the image is darker. So uh, in this case, uh, I'll discuss later, but we've um, used a normal distribution uh, to determine what P is. And then I1, I2 are the high frequency encodings that are generated using this variable precision parameter. And then I3 is this normalized depth map. So I, that, that may be a bit confusing, um, but I will go into more detail about that shortly. Um, I is just when you smush I1 through I3 together into that 2D image format so that we can compress it, we can put it on a thumb drive, and we can you know, store it away for, for as long as you need. Um, so as I said, the, the hard part is really getting that, that variable P parameter. So um, vari the variable P controls the per pixel frequency of the encoded image, and we want that. The problem is um, we need this variable precision parameter, we need P, in order to both encode and decode our data. But we want to generate P with knowledge of our, of our geometry. We want to generate it um, knowing Z because the, the whole point is we want to encode things we care about with high precision and, and things we maybe care less about with lower precision. But to do that, we need to know where those things we care about are. So, and um, because we're generating P, I, J with, um, with knowledge of Z, we don't know Z at the time of decoding because we haven't gotten it back until we're finished with decoding. So we need P, I, J in order to decode our information. So that's kind of the, the crux of the problem here. Um, our solution is we can generate P with an approximation of Z. So we know that I3 is, uh, this third color channel is a normalized quantized version or will be quantized uh, version of our original depth information. So if we can simulate that quantization prior to the generation of P, then we know that after we store our image and then, and then get I3 back out, we separate our color channels back out, I3 will be quantized and normalized. So if we can do that operation prior to generating P such that we can get our, our variable 
um, or our variable precision, our variable frequency encodings, um, then we can, you know, we can do the exact same operation on, on the decoding side of the equation. So once again, that was a lot of information, but I'm going to illustrate it more, uh, more visually here. Um, the process really is we start with this, we start with this normalized depth map that's stored in the third color channel of our, of our image, or it's our third, you know, very low frequency encoding. Um, we then quantize it. We just slap it with an 8-bit quantization operation in order to get this term that I'm calling I3 prime. And I3 prime, so the quantized normalized depth map, is what we're going to map to our variable precision, our variable P, our variable frequency um, variable, really. Um, and we can do that for any arbitrary distribution n. And so in the case, every time I'm showing you guys a sphere, I'm using a normal distribution centered about the mean depth value in the, in the sphere. So in this case, the mean depth value is you know, right about here. So, um, and that's how we get our variable precision p. Then we use our, our variable p in order to encode our, um, you know, to encode our, our nice high quality depth information sinusoidally, uh, like I've talked about before. And then we can store it in an image. And then the important thing, once again, is that the, uh, the third color channel, the blue channel in this case, which stores I3, after it's been stored in an, Im an image and separated back out into its constituent components, I3 is going to be equivalent to I3 prime here. And that's why we're able to regenerate the exact same variable P that we are on the encoding side of the equation on the decoding side of the equation. So that's kind of the nuanced point of, um, of the encoding process. So decoding, like I said, all we have is I and a few overhead parameters that define um, you know, the, some, some parameters about the geometry. But we, we have I as the image, and we can separate it out into its three channels. And we can use I3, which is now quantized, in order to regenerate our variable precision uh, parameter, our variable P. Um, after we do that, we can uh, solve for the depth value, because these are just sinusoids. So we can just take, you know, we can take the, um, the inverse tangent of the one over the other, and we can get this high frequency information back. We can get our nice depth information back. Unfortunately, because the inverse tangent function is um, is only defined from zero to two pi, this is not gonna be continuous. It's gonna have sharp discontinuities as you can see. This does not look like our original depth information. So what we have to do is we have to use this third channel, like I talked about previously, our third channel is gonna be used to help us get this, this nice high quality depth information back into its original form. So we scale this a little bit so it's in the same, uh, same dimensions as, as our high frequency wrapped phase. Um, and then we can use this low frequency signal in order to generate a, um, uh, what's called a stair image, or K, which is going to tell us how many intervals or how many increments of 2 pi we need to add to this to remove these discontinuities at every point. Um, and then from that, we can, we can unwrap our phase just by doing that operation, by just adding 2 pi's to this until it's nice and smooth. And then from our unwrapped phase, we can, we can get our nice high-quality depth information back out of these two sinusoids. So that's the decoding process. The whole, the whole point of this slide really is to illustrate that from our encoded image, we can get our depth information back with just a little bit of math. So uh, I've been promising throughout this whole presentation that a variable P, a variable encoding frequency, is going to give us variable uh, precision. And let's remember that precision is the opposite of error, right? So if I have high precision, I'm going to have low error. Um, and this slide really illustrates that we're able to do that with a variable encoding frequency. So this is the exact same sphere that I've been talking about before with range 256 millimeters. And I've encoded it uh, with a variable frequency where the frequency was, was distributed based on the mean, uh, normal distribution centered around the mean depth values present. And we can see that where the, uh, the number of encoding periods is high, the error is lower. So this dark blue color corresponds to low error, and this lighter blue color corresponds to slightly higher error. So where the number of encoding periods is low, we get higher error. Where the number of encoding periods is high, we get higher error, which is exactly what I promised throughout this whole thing. So uh, graphically and numerically, it looks kind of like this. So if we take two encoding periods, just a fixed frequency like I was talking about before, um, the error is very high. If I have a, uh, a higher number of encoding periods, in this case six, the error is somewhat lower. Um, but if I take a variable encoding frequency from 2 to 6, then I can see that my error is reduced when compared to 2, and it's slightly increased when compared to the, the higher frequency case. So these are the associated file sizes. And this is where it, once again, might get a little, maybe a little confusing. So when I go from 2, encode, two encoding periods to 6 encoding periods, uh, my error increases, and my file size 
um, I'm sorry, my error decreases, excuse me, and my file size increases. So this metric down here is the number, the, inc the decrease in error for each byte of, uh, of additional file size required when you go from two to six. So you get a 0.3 mil or micron decrease in error for every additional kilobyte of information it requires to represent. So whereas the case where you're comparing two to this variable precision method, um, where you're, uh, you're getting 4.46 micron decrease in error per additional kilobyte of overhead file size. So all this is really saying, this might be a confusing metric, but really what it's, what it's getting at is that this, this variable precision method is closer to the, the, the high frequency case than it is to the low frequency case in terms of error, but it's closer to the two, frequent, or the, the two encoding period case um, in terms of file size. So you get kind of the best of both worlds. You get decreased file size and not that much more error. Um, so up to this point, I've talked about uh, distributing the frequency, you know, distributing our number of encoding periods uh, centered around a normal distribution um, with the, the center at, I'm sorry, using a normal distribution centered at the mean depth values. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because you, you usually want to represent the thing that's, uh, that has the most data within your scene with the highest precision. Uh, because usually you're going to be scanning something that you care about to begin with, potentially, or something that you care about is going to be broader in the scene. Um, but this is a counterexample to that. So this uh, this scan for the scan of the surface of Mars that I, I used earlier in this presentation has a crater in the middle and it has a plane on the side. And I care about the crater. I don't know about everyone else. I, I'm sure NASA probably cares about the plane too. But really, everyone's interested in the crater, right? Um, but before I get too into too much detail about this, uh, this is a really cool scan because it's really big. It's 14,000 pixels by 7,000 pixels, and it, it, the, the depth range, everything I've done so far is in millimeters. This one's in meters, and it's 734 meters of depth range. And it's almost half a gig in its raw form, so it's huge. This is a massive scan. Um, and if I use a normal distribution to encode this, like I did before with our variable precision method, then you can see that the number of encoding periods, so 1 over p is the number of encoding periods, is high on the plane. And it's low in the crater. And that's counterintuitive, because I'm, I, you know, I care about the, the crater more. And we can see that our error map reflects this. So the error is lower on the plane than it is in the crater. So the blue, the dark blue region is representing lower error, and the, this reddish brown region is representing higher error. So um, we can see that I get 0.03 meters of RMS error globally, and even higher in our region of interest. We get 0.07 uh, meters of RMS error. Although we are able to achieve file size reduction still, an 8.8 .8 to 1 compression ratio when you're comparing this 411 megabyte original file size. But this still isn't suitable because it's not, um, you know, my region of interest has high error and I don't want that. So what I can do is I can just flip my normal distribution. I just take, you know, one, I just invert it really. Um, so now I'm centering more of my encoding periods around the, the crater, which is my, my thing of my, my object of interest, my feature of interest. And you can see that the, uh, the error map effectively flips as, as a result. So I get higher error on the plane and less error in my region of interest. And you can see that um, this, this trend is also reversed. So my RMS error globally is 0.1 meters, but my um, RMS error in my region of interest is 0.49 meters, which is lower than it was in the, in the previous case. So, and uh, additionally, I'm able, to, uh, I'm able to reduce my file size significantly all the way down to 27 megabytes compared to this 411 megabytes of original data. Um, which is cool. So that, uh, that experiment illustrates this idea that the, the distribution, the way that you map your number of encoding periods is arbitrary. You can do whatever you want. And this, this uh, experiment will further corroborate that. So I have this scene that was captured from a Microsoft Connect, which is pretty cool. And also shout out to the, this guy. I know his face is kind of obscured, but this is Jacob. So he's one of the authors on this paper. And then this is uh, Xiaobing Zhu, who works in our lab. Um, so they're you know awesome for standing in front of a connect while we uh, you know while we take picture three D pictures of them, but um, we can see that we have two people that are spatially isolated um, with some stuff surrounding them that we may not care about too much. Um, so in order to map this distribution, we intelligently selected points. So in this case, we used MATLAB's uh, facial detection algorithms in order to figure out where their faces were, and then we mapped uh, a bimodal distribution. So instead of just a normal distribution. Uh, we're mapping a bimodal distribution centered about both of their faces. So this could prove to be a problem normally because you can see Xiao Bing is much closer to the camera. He is taking up a lot more space. The, uh, and here it's white. Um, but he's taking up more space even though they're about the same size. I think Jacob's even taller. But, um, and Jacob is much smaller in the frame. So you can see that's reflected in the histogram too where this is the, um, this is the, the first person in the frame. This is Xiao Bing and this is Jacob. 
Um, that doesn't matter as much. But the point being, we're now mapping a bimodal distribution based on two points that we've, uh, we've detected in the frame. And this is the resulting error map. So we can see that where the people are, uh, the error is low. And where the people are not, the error is slightly higher, which is what we're going for. So this experiment really also highlights the way that we can, we can select distributions that fit our data. Um, so here we use bimodal. Previously, we used an inverse normal or even a regular normal distribution in order to map our frequencies. Um, and then additionally, we can use intelligent methods like uh, image processing methods or um, uh, features, feature detection methods in order to determine where we want to center those, uh, those distributions. So in summary, this method presents um, a, a novel way of compressing 3D data such that we can compress uh, objects of interest within our scene with higher precision than the, the rest of the scene, which we might not care about as much. Um, and these distributions can be determined arbitrarily based on the data um, or, you know, um, based on the application that you're, you're, um, you're compressing for. So this, this means it's, it's really suitable for, uh, you know, anything that you want. It's a, it's a very flexible method. Um, if you have any questions, you guys are more than welcome to contact either me or my advisor. Um, at our emails listed here. Additionally, these QR codes will take you to the, uh, the papers. Uh, this one was the one that was published uh, for EI 2020. This is the one that was published as um, for Applied Optics in June. And uh, then this will take you to our, our lab's website so you can see other work that we're doing. If you're interested, I'll leave this up for just a second while I um, reiterate that I'm, I'm super excited to be here. I'm really glad that I got to give this talk. Um, thank you guys for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm going to take my slides down so I can actually see you guys. But thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. This, is, this was a brilliant presentation and a fantastic paper. So congratulations again for um, getting the award. Very well deserved. Um, so I would like to open the floor to questions now for Matthew. Um, Please feel free to, um, to put your mics on and, and ask questions. If you prefer to raise your hand, do so. Um, I would ask you again if um, you could put your cameras on, so uh, if you feel comfortable, of course, so we, we, um, we see you. Uh, if not, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. So do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, maybe I will, um, I will start with some questions, Matthew. So first of all, I have to say, I really like this arbitrary distribution selection. I think it's pretty cool. Um, um, now, um, this variable precision compression parameter, your encoding uh, variable encoding frequency, do you see it being applicable to other compression or encoding methods? Yeah, so well, the, the concept at its core is really applicable to, um, to I, I think, a, a wide variety of, of compression methods. Um, the way that you generate that variable parameter may have to change depending on what, sure. uh, what signal, that third signal I was talking about, because pretty universally people are using two high frequency encodings um, mm. and then one low frequency encoding that's used to unwrap that. Um, and I, I think that depending on what that third signal is, the one that you're using to unwrap, uh, you may have to generate your variable precision parameter differently. In a different yeah. manner, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I, I definitely think it's applicable to other compression. Do you know if it has been applied around the, um, the idea? It, it has not yet, no. Uh, it I has mean, not yet. Okay, besides so in our lab, at least. But is I, it, yeah, right, okay. Um, any other comments on that from our audience? Maybe I should move to um, the next question. Um, so I, uh, this method is general, not compatible with lossy image compressions uh, with standards such as JPEG. Um, have you got any idea about ways to implement this same method with lossy compression? And what about lossy versus uh, not uh, versus lossless 3D compression? Sure. So yeah, I did. I kind of brushed over that in my talk. Um, but yeah, so this method in general, as, as it's presented right now, is only compatible with lossless. And that's because of that, um, the way that we generate our variable parameter is using that yeah. quantized uh, version of our, or the quantized normalized version of our depth map. Um, and the reason that, that it wouldn't work right now with lossy is because um, it's not so simple as a, just a quantization and normalization operation when you're mm -hmm. using like JPEG. Um, mm -hmm. because JPEG really mixes all the color channels up yes. when it's compressing. So, yeah. uh, so it would be more difficult to do it directly like that. 
Um, one approach that could work, and uh, we've, we've played around with a little bit, is utilizing something like a primitive to approximate our geometry. So like a human face can, can reasonably be approximated by like an ovoid hemisphere. So if you could represent an ovoid hemisphere and you need, what, five parameters for that? You know, it's uh, three parameters for the center and then uh, two radius scaling parameters. Um, then you could, you know, you could generate an approximation that could be used to, to generate our variable precision parameter. Um, and that would probably work okay, but it, it would not be as good as, as generating it directly from the geometry. Right. So there is a question from Alexandros Tsurapis. Um, Alexander, would you like to, um, to ask your question yourself? I see it in the chat, or would you prefer me to go ahead? So the question from Alexandros, I read it out. It's from the chat. Have you explored more advanced coding methods that support higher big depths than JPEG? And what happens with the loss introduced by such a codex, since you would have an impact to your PIC, um, computation? I guess that would be indirectly answered now. He says, yeah, because we discussed that. So please go ahead. Okay, I hadn't read, uh, Alexandre, the, uh, I read it out. I hadn't read previously your question, so we, we can move on, I guess. Sure. Um, any more questions? I have one more. Um, what about texture? Um, um, I understand like color, color you know, primarily center around uh, 3D data itself uh, and not associated um, with texture. Can you use the method? It can be applicable to other fields to encode texture, um, color texture? Um, so typically the, the way that we transmit color texture when we're, we're dealing with the, the image-based uh, 3D range geometry compression algorithms um, is we, we just transmit it alongside. So if I have like a 512, 512, 512 by 512 frame of 3D data, then I'll just transmit the equivalent 512 by 512 three channel 2D RGB color texture alongside. Um, we have done some interesting work in our lab um, with two channel methods um, where we reduce the number of, of uh, encodings that we need to two so that we can utilize that third color channel to store texture um, by representing the, the color texture as a Bayer image. And then, and then separating it out and storing those all as one channel. But at the end of the day, it's just you're, you're effectively downsampling your color texture. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's one way you could transmit it, or you could just transmit it alongside. So it, it depends on the application. OK. So thanks. There is uh, one question again in the chat uh, from Kim Jiro. Uh, Amano. Um, he said he might have missed this, and I think he did, um, but um, 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 how to choose the number of the parameters would, uh, how to choose the number of the parameters, would it be parametric or not parametric? Could you make any comments about the speed of the processing, please? So um, to address the, the second part of the question first with the speed of the processing, um, it, it depends entirely on how you want to distribute your frequency or your number of encoding periods within the frame. So if you want to do um, fancy, uh, you know, algorithmic ways of, of doing it uh, by, you know, detecting faces and then, you know, centering distributions around the number of faces, then the, the computation time can be quite long. Um, but I mean, long is also very relative. So the, the, the crux of that is, I suppose, I have not implemented it yet on a real, um, you know, production system. So uh, the computation time, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to quantify that, but it, it's certainly slower if you want to do, you know, facial recognition and things like that in order to locate those points. And it's much faster if you just have a normal distribution that I'm just going to, I'm going to slap onto my, the mean, um, the mean depth value within my frame. Um, the, the first part of your question was how to choose the number of parameters. Um, that could be done algorithmically, or it could just be done by inspection. I assume you're, you're talking about the number of parameters that are required to, um, to generate the distribution. Um, it also depends on which distribution you're using. So if you're using a normal distribution, then you can do it with just the mean and the variance. Um, and then if you're using more complex distributions, the number of parameters will go up. So The number of parameters may also be referring to the number of stairs. How might you choose that? Yeah, so the, the number of stairs as well is, is definitely uh, dependent on the application. Um, so it, and, and this, the range of the data to begin with. So the number of encoding periods. Um, so I, I didn't mention it explicitly, but for, um, for that high rise data, which was huge and very high resolution and very, with a very large depth range, uh, we used up to 16 uh, encoding periods. Whereas for the face or for the, the human face and the, um, 
the sphere we only used up to six just because the depth range was was smaller um, it will also affect the the overall precision and file sizes so it, it, once again that's that's application dependent I hope that um, that answered your question sufficiently uh, we have one um, where we had the communication between Tyler and Alexandros uh, Alexandros um, has I think uh, entered another question in the chat. Uh, I'm reading it out another issue is that currently most depth images directly captured from cameras such as iPhone contain considerable amount of noise so he's curious if you have evaluated uh, behavior performance on such depth images or if the performance is to um, first the noise and then and then perform the compression sure so the um so in, in terms of noisy data that's one of the big reasons why we we like to use image-based compression why we're using uh, why we're using 2d images to represent our 3d data because we do have access to a lot of um, a lot of those mature image processing techniques so that would allow us to effectively denoise our images de -noise. Uh, yeah. prior to encoding which would be beneficial and have you played out with noise with various amounts of noise and how this works somehow to what to what extent um, so we, we have dealt with noisy data, um, but I, I have not done any explicit experiments where I'm, I'm varying the amount of noise present right. and seen beforehand. Right. Um, mm -hmm. the, the problem with just using a, like a, a naive uh, noise suppression um, technique, like just applying a median or a Gaussian filter, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Or we, it, you degrade your, your, your original data. Um, Absolutely, and, 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 and all these um, smartphones uh, would have a, a variable um, variable denoising and, and scene dependent denoising, so it would um, it would be a, a, yeah, a different way. And there and there is still a, a one more question from Alexandros. Alexandros, I wish you were um, you were um, uh, coming into discussion, but I'm I, I, I'm happy to keep reading. It's just because you have very interesting questions. Uh, you may wish to look. Um, at some work recently done in MPEG for uh, the compression of point clouds. So geometry is in fact not only projected geometry, um, but defined in 3D. You may wish to look at how your scheme could may be used in that context and especially for VPCC. Uh, 3C, 3, uh, VC3 and GPCC can provide pointers if you have not heard of these standards. So okay. this is more a comment, I think. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's <laughs> very, very, very helpful though. Uh, we can definitely look into that. Okay, one, so one thank downside. you very much again, Alexandre, for, um, for, your, uh, for your input. And uh, we understand that we are all in our homes and it's, uh, it can, the, the environments can be challenging, but it's quite, uh, an interesting um, experience. So do we have any more questions or comments from the audience? As I can mention something in response to one of uh, Alexandros' uh, comments on the depth images from the sure, iPhone. You had, you, had, you had a comment, Tyler, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. so while Matt mentioned this, this method has not been used with um, noisy depth images from something like the iPhone itself. Uh, similar methods have been. And what, what we found is that um, you could denoise them first, or if you are transmitting them with, um, within an image-based compression that can handle lossy, uh, um, further lossy compression, what you actually get is almost a low-pass filter for free. Um, it's an interesting, and it sounds maybe counterintuitive, but it's an interesting phenomenon where you, you may have to spend a little more in terms of file size, but the result actually looks cleaner coming out because of the lossy compression that happens to the encoded 2D image. Right, right. So it's almost right. a right. image processing and compression in, in one. That's not always Working perfect. Together but, and, 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 and producing a better result. That's, that's so really interesting. It, yeah, it's, practic it's maybe not something you'd want to do for high precision measurement, but practically it can offer a two birds, one stone. Well, you wouldn't, I mean, it depends where you use, I mean, if you have iPhone images, you wouldn't use it for high precision measurements. So, so it might exactly. be, it's a, it's a good idea. Great, thank you, Tyler. Um, any more comments, guys? Well, if we don't have more um, discussions, I would like to close the seminar today and, and, um, and thank Matthew for this brilliant presentation. Again, congratulations on your paper, a very exciting work and good luck with your PhD. Um, 
And I would like to thank all of you for showing up uh, in this seminar. And I hope to see you um, in the next one. We are, we are, we are already um, closing the sixth seminar and we have uh, one or two more. Um, go to uh, the imagine.org uh, imagine website to see uh, the remaining seminars. Uh, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thanks so much. Thank you.